Welcome to BCRF Zoom. This is Margaret Flowers, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by BCRF investigator, Dr. Ken Offit from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center here in New York. You know, as we um, honor or maybe remember our fathers over the Father's Day weekend and move into Men's Health Week, we asked Dr. Offit to join us to talk about something maybe a lot of men don't think about, and that's BRCA. BRCA is a gene that is most commonly associated with hereditary breast cancer, but it impacts men as well. And Dr. Offit is here today to tell us about that. Um, welcome, Dr. Offit, and thank you so much for joining us and taking time out of your very, very busy schedule. Um, I'd like to begin by asking if you could just briefly introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about the work that you do in understanding hereditary cancer. Well, thanks, Margaret. It's you know great to be with you uh, virtually. Um, you know, uh, over the, uh, during this this difficult period, um, our clinics at Memorial are are running uh, at uh, full full capacity. Um, we are uh, a clinical genetic service where we see family members of patients that are at risk for hereditary cancers, which we'll be talking about today. So we see men and women and children. Um, and uh, over the last 20 years, we've, as you know, discovered a lot of the pathways that cause to increase cancer risk in families. And we've been providing genetic testing for uh, patients with cancer and their family members um, for decades. And over the course of this last challenging period, we've been doing this 100% um, with uh, telemedicine. Uh, we did telemedicine before uh, this crisis, um, but now we're really doing it. And I must say, I just did a clinic yesterday with 22 uh, families and individuals, and um, you, you get to go into their homes, you know, and it's great. You feel very personal, you know, you can see their, you know, the backgrounds, the kids, the pets, it makes it, we always thought we were very personal, you know, in our approaches, but when you're literally in the homes of folks, um, it, it makes it even more poignant. So what we do is we provide them um, with the testing. Now we're doing a lot of the testing with saliva samples, interestingly uh, enough, um, instead of blood. Um, and uh, we then give folks the results and then we uh, give them the advice uh, as to what could be done for prevention and detection um, and sometimes treatment. Uh, and we also carry on research during this period as well. So it's the clinical genetic service. There are five doctors and 20 genetic counselors at Memorial that are providing these services. So um, the BRCA gene, BRCA, we hear a lot about it. Um, probably the most well-known um, cancer-causing gene, and we often hear about it when uh, maybe a celebrity or, or you know comes out in the news and and talks about having the gene. And I wonder if you could um, briefly explain to us what is a cancer susceptibility gene and what does it mean to to have the gene so one of the things we're always you know quick to point out is that all of us have the genes um the brca genes are normal genes they, they have very important functions in cells and it's only when you have mutations of these genes that they behave in an atypical way and actually increase cancer risk so what these genes do normally is they help cells decide how to grow and to regulate themselves. But if you happen to be born with a mutation in one of those genes, then the cells grow and divide in an abnormal way and you go on and get, uh, get a cancer uh, in your adult life, uh, very, uh, very commonly also in the pediatric setting. These genes you've heard of, as you mentioned, Angelina Jolie sort of made famous the RCA one and two, although that was a good decade after the, they were discovered. But there are other genes that your um, uh, listeners uh, and watchers will be aware of um, that have names that are not as common, PALB2, CHECK2, we'll mention some of them today in ATM. These cause breast cancer, both in men and women, we'll mention. And then the colon cancer genes, MSH2, MLH1, or some of those, um, colon cancer is commonly also a hereditary cancer. And then we also see hereditary cancers of other sites. Um, in women, uh, we have the, uter the uterus and the ovaries. And in men and women, we have the colon, the thyroid, the stomach, and the pancreas are all sites of inherited cancers that are caused by mutations in these 
normal growth regulatory genes which cause a cancer if you're born with a mutation in one of them. Mm -hmm. So um, when, when we typically associate the BRCA gene with women in breast cancer, and uh, as you were just saying that men can also inherit this, this mutation, how does it affect men differently from women? You, you just said that men, that it will cause breast cancer in men. What other, um, how else does it impact men? So for men, um, we do have this risk of breast cancer, and we'll talk a little bit about that perhaps in a little more detail um, as we go along. Um, but we, we also discovered early on in our work, particularly with the Ashkenazi, the Eastern European Jewish population, we'll also mention that, um, that these men uh, appeared to get prostate cancers and made that one of the early associations with prostate cancer in males. And, and the prostate cancers were aggressive prostate cancers. Um, they, for the men listening, um, they probably, hopefully don't have the experience, but if they do, to have a, a biopsy, there's the Gleason score that tells you how aggressive a prostate cancer is. And the men with BRCA mutations tend to get pretty high Gleason prostate cancers. So the prostate cancer in males is probably our most significant cancer risk, even more so than the breast cancer, which men do get, but is rarer. And then, of course, in men and women, there's an increased risk, but fortunately, it's not that common of getting pancreatic cancers as well that run um, in both males and females. Do we know if there are uh, racial or ethnic differences um, in both the prevalence of BRCA mutation and, you know, and the, maybe the impact of BRCA mutation in among men? Yes, and, and the the... the all of genetics is ancestry. In fact, there are companies, right, that will tell you about your ancestry, but we don't really need those ancestry companies very often in our clinics when we see individual mutations. So for BRCA, for example, uh, the general population of men and women, because it's the same, it's uh, probably around one in 400 will carry a mutation you'll be born with in one of those BRCA genes. In certain populations in the world, um, that risk can be 10 times higher, one in 40. Uh, I discovered the common mutations in the Ashkenazi Eastern European Jews, but we also see a very high rate of these mutations in other groups that have been isolated geographically. And the Scandinavian countries are a great example of that. And we have um, mutations, for example, in Iceland, um, as uh, well as in Finland um, and Norway that are some of them as common as we see in the Ashkenazi Jews. And then we also have mutations um, that are common in other parts of the world that we sometimes see in the United States. For example, there's a particular BRCA1 mutation in Poland, which is extremely common. And um, in, in Chicago, that's one of the most common mutations because of the Polish um, American or individuals of Polish ancestry. Um, these are counter mutations, we call them. Um, in French Canadians, we also have these mutations. These mutations happened when populations were isolated in history, generally because they're literally on islands, like in the Scandinavian country, countries. But in the case of the Eastern European Jewish population, the isolation was really tied with persecution and um, a limiting of the area uh, to where the population could live um, in an island which was sort of defined by armies <laughs> rather than by oceans. Yeah, so now a man with a BRCA mutation, um, can he pass that on to his children? So one of the great misconceptions about, about um, you know, the male connection with BRCA is that you only look to the mother's side of the family and you're thinking of your mother's history of cancer, your aunt, your sisters. Um, but in fact, um, it can come from either side and 50% of the time it's from your father and 50% of the time it's from your mother. And some of the most challenging family histories that we see are those where a woman will come in and say, I have no family history, or a man will come in, say, with a prostate cancer and a BRCA mutation and say, I, I, don't, I don't have a family history. 
very often the mutations will come from the men and you may just not see it. So it's a 50-50 uh, uh, probability. It's the same like having a boy and having a girl, 50-50 uh, chance. And so if you have you know, three kids, you may have three girls, you may have three kids, none of whom carry the mutation, but the probability works the same way. And um, you'll remember how that works in your high school probability. You know, it's one half times one half times one half. So you could have a one eighth chance of having three girls and you have a one eighth chance of having three boys and the boys may not show uh, if they have a BRCA mutation. So it can come from, from either side completely randomly. So we know that it's not a common mutation. We do hear a lot, a lot about it, but in the general population, it's not common, but you know, what should a man know in terms of if he doesn't, if he doesn't know of a family history, how might he, what should, what should he know to determine whether or not he could be at risk and how can he, if he finds that he does have a, a, a mutation in the BRCA gene, how can he protect himself and his family? So, so those are two questions. And um, the, the, the first one, you know, which is who should be tested um, is in flux right now. So we're, we're at an inflection point where we are not yet recommending that everybody just get screened for their testing. But I happen to believe, for example, that all men who are of Eastern European Jewish ancestry should be tested. Uh, and I actually believe that all women should be tested as well. Um, and, and that's something that we're in the process of um, proving is safe with a, with a study actually through the Breast Cancer Research Foundation as a, as, a, as a key partner. But outside of a family history and one of those sort of ancestries that I mentioned that have a high risk, um, we have to just rely on um, what we know, which is that you know, the, the family history pointing you in the direction of getting the testing, and that's what insurance would, would involve. For men, where the risk of getting a breast cancer, for example, is exceedingly, exceedingly low, um, we're, we're talking about, for a man, the lifetime risk of breast cancer being on the order of one in a thousand, okay, which is comparing it to one in eight. For women, so there's an enormous difference, right? Um, we don't do routine breast cancer screening for men, but at a one in eight lifetime risk, we sure do it for women, um, and we do it very effectively, and it saves lives. If you have a BRCA mutation, um, then your chance of getting uh, a, a breast cancer increases really quite substantially from that one in a thousand to as much as one in 20, right? So it goes up quite a lot. Although one in 20 is still not all that high, but it's much, much higher than the one in a thousand. So if you're in that group where you have that kind of lifetime risk, what can you do? So what we recommend is that for the men who have these mutations, you should start at age 35 getting breast exams. So what I tell my patients is I say, when you're taking your shower in the morning, you can't see on my camera, so I have to stand. Go like this. Right? Because in men, it's very easy to feel a little nodule and uh, your physician can actually do that exam, but you can do it. Um, and so we say, do your exams yourself. Um, and interestingly, we have not recommended mammography for men with, um, with BRCA mutations, although I do not agree with that. And we meaning the groups that make recommendations, but we just had a very spirited discussion about that, um, which of course is confidential. Um, but I would tell you that I would hope that in the next year, we would change our recommendations to be what we do at Memorial. And that is mammograms do work in men with BRCA mutations. And if you're a man that's got a little bit of sort of, you know, extra tissue in his breast, and unfortunately a lot of us do as we get older especially, you can easily do a mammogram for men um, who are at high risk. And a study was done in the last year that shows that you can detect breast cancers in men with BRCA mutations. So we recommend doing mammographic screening in males with BRCA mutations. Mm -hmm. And we do feel that we can find these cancers just like we can with women um, at an early and a detectable stage. We recommend doing it on the earlier side. Most of the breast cancers in men, like in women, happen earlier. 
So the risk is in the 30s and 40s. So that would be the period in which you should be looking. And then, of course, we mentioned the prostate cancer risk. And then, and for prostate cancer, we have a test. Um, it's controversial to some, but not, I think, in this setting. And that's the PSA, or the prostate-specific antigen. It's a blood test. And we recommend that uh, in men that have BRCA mutations. And in fact, we even have a different threshold of what's considered normal in a BRCA mutation carrier that's lower than it is in, in someone in the general population. And there we do biopsies and find these prostate cancers at the early curable stage. And the other thing, Margaret, I'll mention if you'd want, um, it's, it's, it's of interest to your younger viewers, um, is that uh, both for men and women, um, but particularly, you know, we, we do mention this to men um, um, uh, as well, uh, you can use the genetic information in, in, in family planning and reproductive planning, and you can actually do um, uh, together as a couple um, uh, in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetics so that, let's say, a man has a mutation and doesn't want his daughter to have it, um, that can be arranged, <laughs> as it were, um, using uh, the reproductive technologies that we have nowadays. This is really fascinating. That is just a wealth of information. And uh, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us 